Welcome, everyone. We are going to look at tissues in this lecture. And the way we're going to cover these tissues is we're going to uh, break it up into uh, four different parts in this lecture. So we will start with epithelium, then we'll pause, and then I'll make a separate video for connective tissue, then we'll pause, and another one for muscle tissue, pause, then we'll finish up with nerve, and then we'll create a one, two, three, four. A fifth video will be on like an overview, like we'll do some quiz questions, we'll pop in a few quiz questions there, see how we do. And then if there's time, um, I'll do uh, skin and nails. If not, and it's running a little bit late, then I will send everyone uh, the video for those two short extended videos on skin and nails. It's probably another 10 minutes or so or 12 minutes, but we'll see how we're doing on time. We'll see your energy and then we'll take it from there. So when we look at, let's use red here, we look at tissues. Remember, tissues are a group of cells that have similar structure and function, right? If you think back to the organization of life, it was chemistry, chemicals come together, chemicals make cells, and then cells come together and they make tissues and tissues come together to make organs, and then organs come together to make systems, and then the 11 systems come together and they make the organism. So we're looking at when the cells come together by the cell junctions, remember cell junctions could be uh, desmosomes, hemidesmosomes, uh, gap junctions, tight junctions, they're just Think of them as different types of rivets that can bring two things together and make something larger. So the four types of tissues are going to be epithelium, connective, nervous tissue, and muscle tissue. Now, nervous and muscle, these are going to be probably the easiest and the shortest to learn. Connective is probably the longest to learn in epithelium. Not so long. Um, there is a major difference between epithelium and connective, and I will explain what those are, especially under, under microscope. So all tissues have distinctive structures or forms or patterns, right? This is structure, which is going to determine function. Okay, we know when tissues come together, Tissues are going to come together and they're going to form different organs like the heart and the kidneys and the lungs. When we study these tissues, the study of tissues is what we refer to as histology. Now we're going to look at epithelial tissue first. And one of the unique and distinct features of epithelium is that when we look at it under a microscope in all of these pictures here, you'll notice that it's a bunch of cells that are closely packed together, right? They're compressed and they're squeezed together. They don't have a lot of space between them, okay? So when we have epithelium, it's going to be a bunch of cells closely packed together whether they're that shape or tall columns like this, where they're columnar shaped, or whether they're flat and irregular type of cells like this, right? These are like flat and irregular shaped. So in either way, these are still closely packed cells with very little extra cellular matrix or ECM. Lots of cells closely packed together with very little, I'll put a down arrow, 
for little extracellular matrix. There's not much happening between the cells. Okay, when we look at connective tissue, connective tissue is different. Connective tissue is we can have a cell here and maybe a cell here with a different shaped nucleus and maybe some protein fibers between them. But nonetheless, there's lots of space between the cells in connective tissue compared to epithelial tissue. Okay, so epithelium, what is it? Its main function and where are we going to find it, right? So epithelium is what we consider a lining or a covering type of tissue. So when I think of a lining or a covering, I think of the skin, right? So the epidermis, epi means above, right? And dermis is skin. So the epidermis is the external surface of the body. That's definitely a covering. Uh, Epithelium can also line body cavities. And we kind of learned about some of those cavities in a previous lecture. But they can also line tubules. And in the word tubule, we see the word tube. So what do we mean by tubes? Anywhere in the body that you can find something that looks like a hose or a tube is going to have epithelium. So if we have Let's say this is the tube, and whether this tube was the esophagus, or whether this tube was part of the intestines, or whether this tube is a blood vessel, or whether this tube is part of the windpipe, trachea, okay? If I were to cut this and take a section of this, and we were to look at it like that, we may have some cells in here and whatever is traveling in spot x right that lumen right there the lumen is the passageway but what's lining the lumen could be a bunch of these cells okay and i'm going to put a nucleus in these and under a microscope we'll be able to see some of these cells, and then we can name them based on their shape and based on the number of layers that we see in epithelium. Okay, so tubules, think of a tubular system. We can also find epithelium in, in glands, certain glands like uh, sweat glands and oil glands. Okay, so the way we name and or classify epithelium is by two main things the number of layers that we see and the shape of those cells and if you think back in the very first or second slide i kind of drew things where i was drawing stuff that was like flat and irregular shaped or i draw these squares these cubes and then the other one was I drew these tall column-like cells, right? So that would be the shape. If we saw something that was flat and irregular shape like that, then that is a squamous cell. And if we see something that looks like a square or a cube, it's cuboidal. And if we see something that looks like a tall building or a column, we call it columnar. Well, that's the shape. But it's how many layers do we see of those things? Do we see one layer? of these squamous cells or do we see more than one layer of squamous or cuboidal or columnar okay so we have to look at it and ask these questions okay actually there should be three questions that we ask right to to name the type of tissue we'll have to say are these cells closely packed together or are they spread far apart that would be the first question because if they're close together, it's epithelium. And then we use this classification, these two questions to then name it. If they're spread far apart, it's connective tissue. We don't use this classification. So once we've established that they're closely packed together, then we say, all right, question one, how many layers do we see? And then number two, what is the shape? Okay, so that if we're looking 
at this in box number one here, if we see on our microscope, well, we have a bunch of cells that are flat and they're only one cell layer thick here. If it's one cell layer, then we use the word simple. If we see that it's multiple la layers, like in number two, we have one, two, three, four, looks like we have five layers here. Then we use the word stratified. Okay, and simple and stratified are going to be used for no matter what, if it's squamous, cuboidal, or columnar shaped, it just depends on the layers. So in this particular box, number one, they're flat cells, so they're squamous cells. In uh, box three, they're cube shaped, right? They look like a square, so they're cuboidal. Same thing for four. If we look in box five, then these are columns, right? So they're columnar. All right, so we've established their shape. So in number one, it's simple squamous epithelium. In box two, it's, sim it's stratified squamous epithelium. Really, the only difference is the number of layers because they're both the same shape. Let's go to box three. We say, all right, the cells are closely packed together. It's one cell layer thick. And so we'll call it simple. They are square shaped, so they're cuboidal. We'll call it simple cuboidal epithelium. But in box number four, we have one layer. We have two cell layers of these cube shaped cells. So we'll call it stratified cuboidal epithelium. In box five, we see that they're, one, they're closely packed together. So we know it's epithelium. We see that they're columnar shaped. There are these columns, so it's simple columnar epithelium. And in box number six, it's two layers, so it's more than one layer, so it earns the word stratified, and it's stratified columnar epithelium. Now, there is another possibility here for pseudostratified. Now, the word pseudo means false. So it really is a simple layer, because it's only one cell layer, but it gives the illusion that it's really multiple. What gives it the illusion is the level of the nucleus, right? If you look in box five, all these nuclei are at the same level. When you look at box six, these are at the same level, these are at the same level, we could see it's stratified. But here, it looks like we have this layer, then we have this layer, and we have this layer, right? It looks stratified, but it isn't. So we call it pseudo stratified. And typically, wherever we see pseudo stratified, we're also going to see this. These are called cilia. Cilia, C I L I A. And these cilia are going to beat rhythmically. They're going to move in the same direction. Maybe they're going to move this way or they're going to sweep and move the other way. Okay, and typically where we see pseudostratified um, cells hidden in between these, we'll see like a little nook. So let me just change the pen color, uh, pen color here. Maybe we'll see something here, a cell here, and maybe another cell here. And these are called goblet cells. And these goblet cells are going to release mucus to the surface. They secrete and release mucus that makes it to the top layer. So we're going to have this sticky substance on the cilia here. So that when the cilia beat rhythmically, sometimes it's moving something along that sticky surface. Okay. And we'll see pseudostratified especially in the airways, right? Because if you're breathing in dust particles, you're going to want the debris to stick to the mucus. Okay, so again, just looking at it, this picture from this view, we see these flat, irregular cells in number one. Uh, it's one layer, so it's simple squamous epithelium. In number two, we see these cube cells, they're closely packed together. It's one cell layer, so simple cuboidal. And then 
box number three to the right, we see these tall columns. They're closely packed together. It's one cell layer thick, simple columnar. Down below, from let's say here to here, it's always from the top layer, right? You always look at the top, the apical layer. You see what type of cell it is and see if it's one cell layer or multiple. In this case, it's multiple flat irregular shaped cells, so it's stratified squamous. In, so we'll call that box number four. In number five, we have cube shaped, closely packed together, but it's one, two layers, so it's stratified cuboidal. Then on number six, we have the pseudo stratified. And again, if you look at the nuclei, it looks like it's at several levels. Even though it's only one cell layer thick, it gives the illusion that it's multiple, so pseudo stratified. And what I said earlier is that typically you get a bunch of these little hairs that are found on top called cilia. And there's one more that I will mention called transitional. Transitional means that these cells can transition in their shape and their size, depending on whether it's a body part that is uh, relaxed or distended. It really depends. Like if you think of a balloon, right? If you have a deflated balloon and you draw a square on it and then you blow up the balloon, the square, when it's fully inflated, doesn't look like a balloon anymore. It changes its shape. And if you let the air out, it changes its multiple shapes. So transitional cells are found in parts of the body in which the organ can alter its shape and size, like the urinary bladder. That can be filled with urine or not. The uh, ureters that connect to the urinary bladder those two can have transitional cells. So some of the function of epithelium is that epithelium can protect us. Think of, think of many layers of the skin. It protects it from excessive friction, right? So we know that it's got to be stratified many, many layers, right? If your epidermis was just one cell layer thick, and then you scratched yourself with your nails, you'd bleed because your nails would be sloughing off that one cell layer. But you can scratch yourself, and then if they did a swab under your nails, they would find your skin cells, and yet you can look at your arm that you just, you know, itched, you know, scratched an itch, and you're not bleeding. Okay? So it can protect us against friction, uh, bacterial invasion, even chemical damage, and the ciliated epithelium, which we can find in the respiratory tract, can sweep these dust particles away from the lungs. Okay, so let's see if I can draw this for you up here. So if let's say this tube here represents your trachea or your windpipe, and I'm again, I'm, this is a tubule, right? I'm making a crude tube. And it is made up of these, let's make a bunch of columnar cells, but we're going to say they're pseudo stratified, okay? So we're making a bunch of these columnar cells, pseudo stratified, and we'll make another on this side because it lines all these sides. And again, sorry, this is supposed to be columnar shaped. Okay, and then in between, we'll put nuclei at different levels. So it's pseudo stratified, right? They're not all at the same level. Okay, you get the point, right? Okay, now somewhere, uh, let's make the cilia now. Let's see if I can get my pen to change color. Let's make this uh, green. So now here, we're going to have cilia. It's going to line all of the pseudo stratified columnar cells. So we're going to call this pseudo stratified ciliated columnar. And then let's put, let's put, let's make this one red. Over here, 
we're going to have a goblet cell and over here we're going to have a goblet cell and over here we're going to have a goblet cell and over here a goblet cell so the red is goblet cells and these goblet cells are going to secrete mucus right and the method that it releases that byproduct is called exocytosis exocytosis so mucus is released exocytosis and it's going to stick here to the cilia so now when you breathe air in and air is coming inward and there's dust particles and debris and smoke all the particles are going to stick to the mucus to the sticky substance right why is that important well you don't want to be inhaling all those foreign particles into the lungs so it traps it now what happens in smokers is that the cilia here the cilia i'm circling it become paralyzed and they burn off so you don't get pseudo stratified ciliated columnar um, in fact even the columnar cells get damaged and then they end up being replaced with squamous cells and if you've ever heard of throat cancer they'll typically refer to it as squamous cell carcinoma squamous cell carcinoma and that happens from the damage in the carcinogens and smoke it paralyzes the cilia it damages the columnar cells and then they make a metamorphosis they change their shape they call it metaplasia metaplasia is when one cell type changes to another they call it metaplasia women know this very well because when women go to the gynecologist and the doctor does a pap smear they're looking for metaplasia they just call it cervical dysplasia cervical dysplasia um, could be a result of a woman on the oral contraceptive due to a, a folic acid or b9 deficiency we've seen that women's cells can go through cervical dysplasia that way or even with hpv right human papillomavirus there are certain strains that are benign and then there are certain strains that could be um, pretty severe and they could be pathogenic and result in in cervical cancer so they biopsy it and they look at what strain it is what strain the virus is some could be cancerous so they want to be careful of that okay um so the ciliated epithelium we know we find them in the the lungs you can also find it in the women's in a woman's um uh, fallopian tubes okay so when those cilia are beating in the uterine tubes or the fallopian tubes it's trying to bring the sperm to the egg for them to meet for um for uh, fertilization okay what else is epithelium used for it's used for absorption so we're going to find epithelium in the gi tract or the digestive tract especially the stomach and the small intestine so you can absorb your nutrients there it is for filtration excretion and secretion i think of the kidneys for that especially when it comes to filtering the kidneys are involved with filtering absorbing secreting so you're going to find different types of epithelium in the kidney especially in a part of the kidney that we call the nephron the nephron is the functional unit of the kidney n-e-p-h-r-o-n nephron is the functional unit of the kidney and the kidney has tubules right tubules and that's where we said that we're going to find epithelium and tubules you'll just hear and learn about them as the proximal convoluted tubule or the distal convoluted tubule okay and at the proximal convoluted tubule and the distal convoluted tubule there happens to be simple cuboidal epithelium okay and also for sensory reception so the epithelium that covers the body surface especially like the epidermis and the skin has many different types of sensory organs affiliated with it that's why you can feel if something touches you if it's hot if it's cold if an insect or a mosquito is crawling on you you can uh, pick that up 
Okay, we've already talked about cilia. We, we, we showed that in that previous slide and how important they are to move secretions and fluids across the cell surface. What I didn't mention is that we have smaller cilia that are called microvilli. And microvilli are really used as a sponge to absorb things. It increases the absorption. So microvilli we find, especially in the intestines. So here's a crude picture of, let's say, the small intestine. And in the small intestine, we are going to have columnar cells there. And we're going to have microvilli, these smaller, smaller little hairs. Sometimes under a microscope, they look like a brush, like a brush border. Okay. So, and then let's say over here, this will be a blood vessel. Okay. So the whole idea, and again, this is just for concept, is that your food, right, the amino acids and the proteins and the carbs, eventually they're all going to be broken down into like amino acids and glucose, right? and triglycerides, they're going to be absorbed into the microvilli, then they're pulled down and they start to move, they get out of the GI tract and they move into circulation, into the blood vessels, okay? But we need the microvilli for that. And this is what ends up happening, I'll try and make this somewhat relevant, um, when you have people that have celiac disease or you have people with gluten sensitivities where the what's in the foods and the proteins destroy and break down these microvilli. And if you break down the microvilli, you can't absorb nutrients. So you get a lot of nutritional deficiency type of diseases. Okay, and that's the problem where people are very, very sensitive to gluten. So they have lots of gluten-free foods or they have celiacs. Okay, so if we look at this, this is a, a question on uh, an older um quiz in the past so it was kind of like drag and drop right so if we're looking at epithelium that can function in diffusion filtration secretion and protection well when we think of diffusion diffusion is when something passes through a membrane going from side one to side two so if this is the membrane and let's say this is oxygen it's a lot easier for oxygen to pass from outside to inside if it's just one cell layer thick. So that's simple squamous. And it's easier for carbon dioxide to go from inside a cell and exit if it's also one cell layer thick. So we're going to find simple squamous epithelium in the lungs, in the alveoli of the lungs, to allow for diffusion for the gas exchange to take place between oxygen and CO2. Okay, epithelium can function in absorption, secretion, and protection. Well, this is when I think of the kidneys, right? The kidneys can absorb, they can secrete, they can protect. And in the kidneys, we said, especially where you have proximal convoluted tubules and the distal convoluted tubules, we have simple cuboidal epithelium. For stratified squamous, this is for protection of the underlying layers. So I'm thinking the skin, especially the epidermis of the skin. Epidermis is above. It's going to protect the underlying layers. So we need many. We need stratified squamous for that. Now, pseudostratified, remember pseudo is false. Pseudostratified, I said, was affiliated with cilia. Uh, usually, we'll find them in the respiratory tract. And what we said also is that they're associated with mucus uh, because of those goblet cells. Remember, the goblet cells produce mucus. So they, epithelium functions in the movement of secretions. You need the cilia to move that mucus across the apical or top surface of the tissues. And then transitional is where it accommodates for both distension and for relaxation or change in that organ volume, whether it's the urinary bladder or whether it's the ureters that can expand a little bit those tubes. Transitional are going to transition and alter in their shape. So to review, 
Remember, when we talk about epithelium, we need to first say, is it one layer for simple epithelium, or is it multiple layers? We call it stratified. Are they irregular and flat shaped? We call it squamous. Do they look like cubes? Then they're cuboidal. And if they are column shaped, then we call them columnar. Squamous is used primarily for protection and diffusion, like oxygen and CO2. And then the cuboidal, we said we find them in the tubules, especially the distal convoluted tubule and proximal convoluted tubule, and some other glands like sweat glands, and they can uh, secrete and absorb materials across that tubular or glandular wall. The pseudostratified, we said it's really simple columnar, but because the nuclei lie at these different levels, it gives the false appearance that it's stratified. And usually wherever we have pseudostratified, we're gonna see cilia. So we're gonna see that in the respiratory tract. Transitional, we're gonna find it along the urinary bladder, the ureters, and parts of the urethra, right? So these can modify and alter in their shape, depending on whether you know, the organ is distended or whether it's stretched or relaxed. So the cells can be flattened when the organ is full, or it could be rounder, when it is empty. Just think of the balloon inflated or deflated. So where are we gonna see these? Well, let's look at the pseudostratified up on the top right. Let's look here at uh, number one, at the one o'clock position. So pseudostratified, whenever you see that, we'll see cilia. You see these little hairs here at the top. We're gonna see them in the respiratory tract stratified squamous, many, many layers. We'll see that at the skin, especially the epidermis or even the esophagus, right? Because as food is passing through the esophagus, right, it's food from the outer world that you're inviting in your body and it could scratch and damage that. So you need lots of layers of protection. Uh, simple columnar epithelium, we'll find them in the intestines. Whoop, let's go back. Uh, the simple cuboidal, find at the proximal and distal convoluted tubules, right? So here's the lumen. This is where urine or filtrate is traveling, but you can see that these are one cell layer thick and it's simple cuboidal. And then simple squamous epithelium, one cell layer thick, we'll find these at the alveoli of the lung because that's gonna allow for simple diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide, CO2, right? So with epithelium, you can have simple squamous epithelium, simple cuboidal epithelium, or simple columnar. And then in the stratified arena, we have stratified squamous, stratified cuboidal, stratified columnar, the pseudo stratified columnar, right? It gives the false appearance that it is. And then of course we have transitional, which is at the urinary bladder, the ureters, and the uh, your parts of the urethra. Okay, good place to take a break.